But I want to ask Chris Yusayan. Chris works with uh, Bravo Wellness. He's the president of Bravo Wellness and healthcare and wellness industry. He is also has a real passion uh, to equip people for the workplace and the marketplace. <laughs> and uh, I'll let him share All right. a little bit more about what he does. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Joseph. <laughs> You know, I, I, I stand up here now just amazed at what everybody's been talking about. And even in, like, the prep for this talk today, how all these themes are just so consistent. So it's it just reinforcement that God's Spirit is truly working over time in each one of our hearts and minds. But I really wanted to talk to you today about, about prayer and prayer in the workplace and some of the things that God's been revealing to us. And I'm hopeful that I can open that what God will speak maybe through me today will open your eyes to a fresh approach to prayer and to opportunities that we have with prayer in our day-to-day -day lives and that uh, you might take away at least one or two things differently as you walk away. <clears throat> so just a bit of background, I've been, I came to Lord about nine years ago and I was at a pretty dark spot in my life and really kind of just decided to give, give everything to him. I, I had hit some crisis I won't go into a lot of detail on that today, but needless to say, uh, not proud of where I was, but I decided at that time to just give everything I had to the Lord. And it's amazing the, the change and the metamorphosis that he's, that's transformed since then. But early on in my walk, uh, I was working for a small company, and I, I just had about eight months before we ended up shutting it down, ran out of capital, but I watched God perform the most amazing miracles in the workplace and things that really built my faith and helped me understand that he does care about work. He does care about what's going on, every detail of our lives in the workplace. And so that was an early kind of foundation building for me. And then he transitioned me into a small executive search firm that was a faith-based firm. And I learned about prayer in the workplace. So we would pray before staff meetings every Monday. We would pray when we go to a client visit. We would pray for issues that we were struggling with. We would just pray about the business, about our families, and it was teaching me that prayer in the workplace, really, it really had an important place. Uh, there was a, a Tuesday morning men's group that Tim Smith was the, the gentleman that owned the organization. He'd been running for about 20 years in his company. And we were studying Oz Hillman. I don't know if anybody here has ever gone through Oz Hillman's studies, but it's all about marketplace ministry. It's about looking at your workplace as your vocation, as your mission field. And it really began to build this knowledge base in me and this desire to want to look at my workplace as my mission field. And then it got supercharged when Tim asked me to be part of a group called Life Work Leadership. It was a nine-month course. There's a few people in this organization. Can you show hands at me familiar with what Life Work Leadership is? So there's a couple people here, not a lot, but, but there were, it was a course designed to help us understand how Jesus Christ led. I mean, Jesus was an amazing leader and the traits and the characteristics that he exhibited in his ministry were ones that we were trying to emulate ourselves. And the first thing was really understanding that my work is my calling and that I was called into wherever I am. And then some of the other things that he would talk about was being generous with our time. And you know, generosity was one of those themes that in the workplace, if we're not generous, if we're holding the money for ourselves, if we're not giving it out to others in a way that changes their life, you know, we're not living out Christ in our workplace. And that we have to lead from a position of humility. And ironically enough, you know, God does have an amazing sense of humor. And I had been invited to this life work leadership course twice, auditing it. And it's just such a coincidence that the course I was invited to twice was on humility. And I, I guess just it was an area of my life God really had to work on a whole lot. And it's not a fun process to go through a humbling but I am so grateful that he has, and he continues to work on me in that area. Uh, it was also one of the, the big topics is about relationships, and it's, it's the depth of relationships that we have to have. And, and if you look, Christ spent three and a half years pouring into his disciples, right? He made a sacrifice. He made a commitment. He said, your time is important to me, and I'm going to invest in you. So the depth of our relationships are the things that transform us in the workplace and what make people want to hear more about who he is and what he does. Showing compassion, working to leave an eternal legacy. You know, Bruce talked today about financial fiduciary investing, but it's about an eternal legacy. What are we doing in the workplace that's allowing us to pour into people's eternity, not just their bank accounts? Now, we have to be able to pay our bills. There's no doubt about it, but what are the things that we can do forever? 
and being courageous to make the tough decisions, and really the importance of prayer in the workplace. And that's what I want to talk to you about, I guess, the, the majority of my time with you this morning is prayer and how God has used prayer in my life and the life of those around me to really reveal things to me that I had no idea were going on about his kingdom. So back in 2012, when I was going through life work leadership, God began to put this burden on my heart about seeing the body of Christ come together. And as a relatively new Christian, I'm on three years in my walk now, I was amazed as I'd been exposed to the riches of this Christian community, and yet I was so disappointed because the body of Christ wasn't working together. I just saw all these resources that were not just, they, they could have done so much more if there was just collaboration instead of competition. And so that's a burden that's just continued to grow on my heart ever since then. And, and fast forward, 2015, I was, called out of, I was called out of Aslan into Bravo about, after about three and a half years where God used that time to really change my character, in fact, maybe build character into me, just help me lead differently to be a different person altogether, but different husband, different father, different friend, different coworker, different leader. He called me into Bravo Wellness, and I knew one of the things I was called to do was to bring more prayer to the organization. I just felt on my heart, this is why, one of the reasons why I'm here. And I don't know if any of you know Jim Pishak or know Bravo, but, but if you look at our walls, we've got scripture on our walls. We've got photos of when Jim Wilkes, Pastor Journey, which was where Jim Pashak, our CEO, would go to, was in our building. Most of our employees were Journey uh, congregants. There was prayer, there was scripture on the wall. So Bravo had, has a, f- a foundation of prayer, foundation of faith. But I know I was called to bring more. So now we begin praying before our staff meetings. We're praying before our quarterly meetings to work on our strategy. We're praying before our monthly all-hand meetings. We're being smarter and smarter about it, but we've really tried to bring as much prayer into the workplace as we can, recognize that this is God's workplace, not our own. The CEO and I meet once a week, and we try to, we try to start our meetings with prayer, whether it's we're praying for a business, we're praying for wisdom, we're praying for families that we know are struggling in the organization, we're praying, you know, just praise of Thanksgiving for maybe new births or new marriages, and it's just that opportunity to come together that it really has transformed our relationship in a way that it makes us stronger because we're, we're in a pretty stressful time, but as we bring prayer into it, it's amazing how that brings a peace. You know, Bruce talked about that just surpasses all understanding. So one of the things that during my time at Bravo was in 2017, uh, I happened to be at a couple of Christian events, surprisingly enough, and I met two brothers that I, I knew relatively well, but not really deeply, and, and as in, our, in our time together, we all shared that we had this burden to see the body of Christ come together. So I had a couple of breakfast meetings. On the second one, I said to the one guy, it was Brian, and I said, Brian, I, I'm sick and tired of talking about this. I want to do something. But I don't really know what something is other than I think it involves a lot of prayer. Are you interested? He's like, sure. So I said, there are three other guys that I think are supposed to be part of this. Are you okay if I invite them? He's like, yeah. So I did, and of course, they all said Yes. So we began meeting in January of 2018, and I knew we had to meet at the Bravo offices. There's something about Bravo that just elicits prayer. I don't know what it is, but, but God does, and in the spiritual kingdom, I'm sure there are things that if I could see it, it would make a whole lot of sense. So we started meeting at Bravo, and we were, anybody here familiar with Graham Cook's Crafted Prayer? All right, many of you are. Well, one of the brothers in the group who I used to work with, Joseph Badger, had actually exposed me to this book, and I read it, and it changed my perspective on prayer. And so we used craft of prayer in our approach. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a pretty simple concept. It's if you want to have every prayer answered, you ask God what he wants you to pray about. And then you sit and you listen. Not that hard, right? But how many of us want to take the time to sit and listen? Many times we pray and say, God, please bless what I want to do, as opposed to, God, what do you want me to do? And then find out what he wants us to do and then go forward after he's imparted upon us. And, and just that little change has been amazing in terms of what he's revealed to us during that time period. So um, we began meeting January 9th, and we used 2 Chronicles 7.14 as our foundational verse. And, and there's a few verses that have really come out powerfully in that time period. But if you think about it, and you just, if you take the time to, to dissect 2 Chronicles, right? It's, if my people, so this is all about us, we go by his name, right? We have to pray. We have to seek his face. We have to turn from our wicked ways. So we just have to pray, seek, and turn. So we have to be effectively. 
And if we do that, he promises to hear, to heal, and to forgive. But he's going to heal our land if we do these things. So that was the foundation of what we began praying on. And about a month in, in our first time where we just we were sitting in quietly and, and, and listening, which if you haven't done this, that's one of the things I want to encourage this group to think about is you, if you take away one thing with prayer, it's to sit in silence. If it's five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, or as Court talked about yesterday, maybe five hours, which is a pretty big commitment. But at the end of the day, it is a commitment, and it's uncomfortable because we're not used to just shutting down and sitting and being silent and being idle. But the power is when we do that, when we sit and when we listen. And what we did is we heard about a month in, we heard this message of unity. There were four of us at night, and we heard unity, unity in our prayers, unity in this place, unify, unite, align. It was crazy how, as we were sharing, this theme was coming out. So we knew, okay, okay this, is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. It just began to build this hunger, I think, in us when all was done. So one of the things that we've learned through this process as, as we're in this time of quiet is that, you know, you really just have to be authentic, you got to be vulnerable, you got to be humble. Because there are times when some of the brothers that I'm praying with are hearing things, and I'm not, and that's okay. It's okay. It's not a competition. It's not that I'm, we're all supposed to hear something. God will speak to each one of us in different ways each evening. But we have to share what those themes are, and then as we do, we pray on those. And then we've, been, we've really been amassing a book of, of notes. It's about the journal. It's about 55 type pages so far of just what God has been downloading on us in that time period. It's crazy the amount. Tom laughs, but he's, he's seen a copy of it. And, and one of the things that we found is that it, if when you really, when you humble yourselves before the Lord, you leave your agenda at the door. You seek him and what he wants. It's amazing what he'll reveal to us. And, and that's really our time of prayer has been where it's not been very structured. We've had a theme, you know, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We don't have an agenda. We don't have a leader. It's just five guys coming together and just saying, all right, let's, Let's just sit in silence, ask the Lord who he wants us to hear tonight, and then we sit, we listen, we share, we journal, and then we pray upon these things. And it's it's just so powerful what he reveals to us. So February 12th was when we heard that the theme of year the theme of unity. First of many messages that our group was like looking at prayer. Prayer is the foundation. If we want to unify the body of Christ in this city, and I think we all do. Prayer is the one thing that we can do that defies all the boundaries that man might set up, whether it's race, whether it's culture, whether it's location, whether it's our theology, it doesn't matter. We all can pray together and seek the God of creation. And when we do, he will reveal things to us, and he does, he has, he is, and he will continue to do so because these are his plans at the end of the day. So our time together, it's had an interesting evolution, and where we've come to now is we, we fast during the day. So when we come in, we come in with a hunger. We, we, we bring praise music in, so we're ushering in this spirit and kind of setting the mood so that we are, we're in a, in a mood of prayer and praise for, the, for our Lord and our Savior. <clears throat> we were having a meal early on. We've decided now in the last few weeks we've been putting the meal at the end because if we're going to come in hungry and we get satisfied right away, we said, no, let's, let's go to prayer with a hunger in our, in our stomachs, in our spirits. And that is amazing what it's done. So now we're coming in, and it's, just, it's supercharging our time together. And then we're, we're listening, we're sharing, we're journaling, and we're praying. And, and the things that God has continued to reveal during the time period. So one of the things early on, I heard the message of feed my sheep. And that's when we started to have a meal. This breaking of bread together is not a surprise, right? I mean, it's, it's powerful when this group comes together. We, we look forward to that meal together because it's just a time of fellowship. It's a time of deepening our relationships with each other and with the Lord. And, and, and we had five guys initially. This has now grown to eight people. But we didn't really all know each other that well. There were a few, you know, relationships that had been longstanding. But for the most part, there was a lot of just new people. But the relationships, the depths have gotten so great because we've been committed. We come together every week. There's a convener. There's a location. It's consistent. It's constant. 
And when you, when you exercise these disciplines and you make a commitment, it's amazing what God is just, he's just waiting for us to do it. He doesn't need our group, but he's chosen our group. I don't know why, but for some reason he has. He's been revealing things to us, and I really believe that one of our jobs is to share what he's been revealing to this group, because it's not for us, it's for this body in this city. And so I've been looking forward to being able to just to share some of these things and just present you know, the opportunity to each of you that you spend time, in, and I want you to spend some time on a, on a couple of verses. So first is Second Chronicles 7.14. Really just ask the Lord to speak to you. What does it mean to you? John 17 has been spoken about a number of times here. That was another verse that we spent a lot of time on and went deep. And, you know, when I look at that verse, and then the third one that we spent some time on was Ephesians 4 in the fivefold ministry. But in each one of these, if you take a step back and you look at what God is telling us in each one, so much of it is about being, being in unity, praying. Just, it's not about going out and doing, and don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we should not go out and serve. That's not my, my point here at all. But God wants us to be with him first, because as we do that, he equips our hearts, he equips our minds, and he helps us to know what he's, when, when, when it's time for us to go out, he will make it clear what he wants us to do. There will not be any guesswork, there no, will not be any chaos, it'll be clear as a bell. But until we know, we have to sit. We've got to sit and we have to wait until he reveals what that, that looks like for us. And that takes time and that takes commitment and it takes energy. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we heard, we were at, back in February of 18, I was on a men's retreat and had, um, there was a time of prayer and one of, the, one of the men that I was with, I had shared with him in a hallway conversation about a couple minutes conversation of, of our prayer group. We were a month in. And in this time of prayer, he just starts to reveal some things to me that God was sharing with him about our group. And, and he said, you know, one of the things he said is that this group has been chosen and it's going to grow. But you don't have to do anything. God's going to make it clear. It's, he, he's got this all. You guys just have to be persistent. You've got to be patient. You've got to stick with what you're doing. And then and don't force it. It's going to be this wave that comes through. You just have to catch the wave. He's going to take care of everything else. It's not your responsibility. So it takes all the pressure off us to just go and be with him and to hear what he has to say. And that's an amazing thing when that happens. One of the, one of the things that we've done that, uh, and again, I'm going to call Joseph out on this because it's been such a powerful thing in our, in our prayer group, but we also do this at work, is we've had some times of encouragement where we just will go around the table and we'll each speak life into a person and how God sees them through our eyes, how much he loves each and every one of us, how he's gifted them. We actually did that in our workplace with our senior leadership team two weeks ago, and it was amazing the life that it fed into our team. And in terms of the theme of relationships, what better way to build relationships and to love into somebody and to share with them the things, because it's, it's so easy to be critical in today's world of what people aren't doing right. How much time do we spend just pouring into people and telling them what we love about them and speaking words of life and affirmation into them. That is, I, I, if you do one thing, if you, I want to ask you to take that back, whether it's your small group, whether it's your family, whether it's your workplace, it doesn't matter. Just with your group, your tribe, your organization that you're with on a regular basis, spend an hour, two hours, just loving on them and speaking words of encouragement and, and, and truth in their life and watch what happens to your relationships. Watch what happens to their confidence. Watch what happens to their leadership. Watch what happens to the output of this organization. It'll change dramatically. We've, we've had a number of visions in our group while we've been together. And one of the visions that was really incredible and pretty exciting is, is one of the guys had a vision of a tent covering Northeast Ohio. And this tent had these large tent poles in it. And this large hand with a pitcher of water came out and it was pouring water onto the tent, but the tent was whisking it away. So we knew then that we were praying against a principality covering this city. And as prayers were lifted up, as prayers were lifted up, the tent flaps were removed and the poles were destroyed and then the Holy Spirit came in and ran like crazy in this city. And it's further reinforcement that prayer is the weapon we have to employ. That's how we're going to fight this battle in this city. It's through prayer. And as our, body, as our voices come together as one, That's when God's going to move. He doesn't need us. He could do without us. 
I mean, look, he took Jonah, he went and transformed an entire city with one man, right? 100,000 people. But I think in Cleveland, he's going to use, he wants us to come together because we have to show the world what unity looks like. We had a vision of five interconnecting circles over northeast Ohio. If you can think of the Olympic rings, you know, and, and we've thought of it a couple different ways. It might, it might represent the, the relationships that our group has and how we're connection points for different people across the city. But it's also tied to the fivefold ministry. In the, in the, there's, that's really an important verse for, or set of verses for us to, to understand because he has given us all five gifts. And those five gifts are used in church, they're used in the marketplace, they're used in ministries. It doesn't matter, but all five gifts are needed because they offset and balance each other. It's apostle, it's prophet, it's evangelist, it's shepherd, it's teacher. All five are equally important. Not one is more important than the rest. But we're all, every one of us in this room has one of those as a dominant gift and one of those as a secondary gift. And if we don't know what they are, we need to know. Because God gave us those gifts for a reason. So we could go use them in his kingdom to share his gospel with other people. And, and so there's, there's just a lot of importance with that. And, and one of the things tied to the fivefold, we had a word about that we're running a multi-generational relay race. Now, if you think about that, there are four legs in a race, right? And each, ra- each runner is designed to run in a specific leg because of his or her giftings. There's a reason why you run a specific leg. You have to stay in your lane, right? you got to stay in your lane, not to get into somebody else's lane, because you get in somebody else's lane, you're disqualified. So I have to know what my gifts are. got to stay in my lane. I've got to hand the baton off to the next person, because if I don't hand it off well, the baton drops, and we lose. We've got to collaborate. Those, you don't find many groups that are more tightly knit than a relay team. They know each other. They know how they're going to run, they know how they're going to hand it, they know where, you know, they can, they can sense them. But that's through time and practice and relationship together. And, and I'm telling you, these, these themes are so important for this city, for us as the body, because this is about the church of Cleveland. It's not about any four walls in this city. It's all about Jesus Christ. We are his church. We are not competing with each other. We are competing with Satan. You know, he is a competition, right? The church is all part, we're all one organization. We're all one living body and organism. And as we know our gifts, it's amazing how this, this, these thoughts will transform how we act, what we do, when we do it. <clears throat> so a few last themes. I think I'm probably running a little short on time here. But what we've heard is this, this is all about Jesus. Our time together on Mondays, even though God is literally changing each one of our hearts, this is all about our Lord and everything we do in this city. Um, We can't think differently, we can't act differently, unless we begin to embrace new concepts. And Tom talked a lot about the church of the city being a concept. Can you imagine if every believer in this city really took that to heart? What would Cleveland look like? Just imagine the possibility of what this city would look like if everybody looked at the city as the body of Christ and not my workplace, not my, you know, not my, my church, not my parachurch, not my ministry, whatever it is, but we're all here to serve our Lord in this city. Um, we know we're fighting a spiritual war. We are. It's real, and our prayers are the weapon we have to dispose it. I mean, we, we can win this. We will win. Christ has already won the battle, right? We just, we just, he's inviting us to be part of this, and we have to use the weapons that he's given to us. And the weapons he's given to us to destroy thr- our strong, strongholds, it's the power of prayer. One of the things that we heard that was really, it's a concept that I struggled with for a while, was that he wants us to work with him, not for him. And I thought, well, well, of course he wants us to work for him. He's God, you know. But, but what, what that came to mean to me over time is that if we're humbling ourselves and we're seeking his face and we're hearing his voice and then we're obedient, we're working with him. If we're coming with great ideas and praying to the Lord and saying, hey, bless my idea, and then go out and do good stuff, we're working for him. Nothing wrong with doing good things, don't get me wrong. But if God didn't call us there, he'd, if he didn't gift us, if he didn't anoint us and appoint us, we're not going to bear the fruit that we should because it's not where he wants us. We've got to be where he wants us. And the only way we know that is we've, we've got to be working with him and not for him. 
We have to be obedient. Obedience is a theme that came up time and time and time again, and it's a word that, you know, it's almost a negative word in today's society. But in the economy of God, it's one of the words that's so important because when we're, when we're hearing his voice and we're acting upon it, not only will we bless somebody else, but our lives will be enriched and blessed so greatly. And so that word of obedience is, is absolutely critical. We've talked about repentance. Repentance is we have to turn from our wicked ways. We have to constantly repent because we've got to get the poison that's in our body. Even though, we look, we've been saved. We have a Lord and Savior who has taken away all of our sins. But we still have sinful nature or sinful habits. We have habits that we, will, we may continue to do, and so we have to be constantly in repentance. And those types of things will also help relationships, and they'll help us move forward in ways we haven't been in the past. This is not about uniformity. It has nothing to do with thinking the same way. It's not about a common theology. It's about unity. Unity of our voices, unity of our hearts. As Tom would like to say, it's a mindset, right? Unity is a mindset. But when we come together in prayer, we're demonstrating that mindset that we're seeking the Lord and what he wants, not necessarily what we selfishly want from our own ways. We talked about the spiritual war. We believe Cleveland's a beachhead. One of the things, if you think about for a while, we were actually spending time, if you look at the Cuyahoga River, the Cuyahoga River is shaped like a serpent. It separates the east from the west. It separates the north from the south. I don't know exactly what it means, but I'm telling you there's something symbolic about this river and water in terms of what it means to Cleveland. In fact, I, last year at this event, one of, the, one of the men that was here this spring, he said, asked me if I wanted to begin to have dreams. And I hadn't had dreams for a long time, and I said, yes, I do. And I began, I've begun to have dreams now. And one of the dreams I had, I was actually down by Lake Erie, and I saw this giant armada get launched into the lake. And it was, it was the body of Christ. And, and if you think about an armada, you've got aircraft carriers, You've got submarines, you've got PT boats, you've got destroyers. They're all equally important in the war. We have this rich community of, of fight Christ followers and believers in this city. And when we begin to act as a true, you know, one team coming together under one Lord, it's amazing the power that he's already given to us. At our, it's at our disposal today. We just have to really leverage it. Um, just for a second, a thought on prophecy. I don't know, has anybody here read Graham Cook's prophecy on Cleveland? A few people, yeah, lots, many. Bob Jones? I, I would encourage all of you, if you haven't read it, go find it and read it. And if you have, refresh yourself on it and pray on it. We must believe this is true. God has given words to others about our city. How can we not believe these words? We have to hold on to them and pray on these things and watch what he's going to do in this city. But this, this city is, it's, it's like a beachhead. There is a lot of darkness in this city, and that's usually there's a lot of darkness because something important is going to happen. I don't know what it looks like or when it's going to happen, but we have to believe it will and pray into this and see what the Lord will reveal to each and every one of us and what, what does he want us to do. So I could go on and on about this. Uh, I'd love to, but the time's running short. My hope is that some of these ideas or these concepts might change your prayer life. You might think of things a little bit different than you have in the past. I'm hoping that God has already been raising some of these things up in some of your hearts and that as these words are being shared, you're just hearing something that, that or it's being reinforced with you that this is what God wants you to be involved with. Because I know he's raising up men and women across the street. He, he has been. He is right now, and he will continue to. And our job is just really to share with you what we've heard. So if I could, I'd like to just, just close this out in prayer, ask you to spend just a few seconds and have the Lord download on you what, what if anything, that's been said today, he wants you to take away as you leave today. Can I break in? Please. Okay. I, I want to say as a pastor, and I think I can speak for the other pastors here, you're an answer to prayer. <laughs> you talked about five fold gifts in the marketplace. The Lord is telling me he's giving you apostolic authority. And I believe he's supposed to pray for a release of the five fold gifts in Northeast Ohio. And I want us all to stand.
God's given you authority, Chris. Mm. You need to go for it. Will you just pray yes. that those gifts will be released and the work gets? <sighs> oh, Father. I come to you humbly this morning. I just thank you. Thank you for using a poor, lost, broken man. Lord, you have blessed each and every one of us with powerful gifts that I don't know that we really know how much power we have at our disposal. Lord, let this day be a time of anointing and appointing. Lord, a time of revelation. Lord, a time of releasing of gifts. Lord God, as we leave here today, my prayer is that for everybody in this room, Lord God, every man and woman represented, that you will just ignite their hearts. Lord God, that we are, we are calling out a releasing of all these gifts in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, you will take these gifts and you will use them for your purpose, for your kingdom, Lord God. Lord God, you would just supercharge these gifts, Lord, that we will just see visions. We will see miracles. Lord God, we will speak prophetic words. Lord God, we will have superpowers and the ability to teach and to shepherd. Lord God, that all of these gifts are just unleashed today. Lord, we say yes and amen. We say this is going to happen. It has happened right now as we go forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, we call this out. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.